Of course, Showboat was a landmark in the American musical theater for many, many reasons. To begin with, no musical had ever written, been written with so much care. Uh, shows in those days tended to be written in two months at the most, and it was quite common for a composer or a librettist to have multiple shows on Broadway in any given season because they would just crank them out like so many uh, television episodes in a sitcom. Um, however, Jerome Kern fell in love with the book Showboat, bought the rights, brought Oscar Hammerstein into the project, and this was the very first time that Oscar Hammerstein had ever written the libretto for a show alone. Up to that time, all his earlier librettos were written in collaboration with his mentor, Otto Harbach. And Ziegfeld was introduced to the project and agreed to produce it, but with certain misgiving, because Ziegfeld really was associated with uh, shows of a much more superficial nature than Showboat. Um, shows that featured lots of comedians like um, uh, Leon Errol and Louis XIV or uh, W.C. Fields, people like that. Uh, the, the idea of showboat, a serious study of early America, was something really quite alien to Flo Ziegfeld. But he sensed the quality of the work, and so he agreed to produce it and present it at the Ziegfeld Theater, following Rio Rita, which was to open the theater. Now, showboat is revolutionary in many ways, not only in the care in which it was created, but because it deals with an entire historical epoch in the American musical theater, in America rather, it starts right after the Civil War and it goes right up to what was then the present, 1927. So it has a tremendous uh, chronological span encompassed within it. Secondly, it takes its characters very seriously. Characters in musicals up to that time uh, were either romantic or they were comic, and there were variations on both of those categories, but by and large, these weren't people to be taken seriously the way you would take a, a character in a drama seriously. But they have real human problems in, um, in uh, Showboat. We have the problem of the protagonist, for example, Magnolia, who is a young girl protected from the realities of life by living on an island, a floating island, if you will, a showboat that doesn't even touch land except to perform shows. A woman who lives and grows up in a dream world where everything she knows about life, all her values, are the values that are presented in the melodramas that are enacted on the stages of the, uh, of the showboat itself. And she falls in love leaves the showboat, leaves this protective cocoon, and goes to Chicago, is left by her gambling ne'er-do-well husband. She has to raise a child in an expensive convent school, and so, and so she resorts to the only thing that she knows how to do, perform, and she becomes a singer in nightclubs, and ultimately a star. Now, we're dealing with very serious problems. A woman, alone, having to learn how to work and survive in Chicago in a hostile environment at the turn of the century. Very daring, very, very daring. And Magnolia, as a character, is the first character in the entire literature of the American musical theater who grows and matures before the audience's eyes in the same way that a character in a drama might do so. Number two, we come to the problem of miscegenation a forbidden subject in any area of theater normally. Very, very few plays ever dealt seriously with miscegenation. But in Showboat, we have the character of Julie, who has been, who is a mulatto. Her one parent is white, one parent is black, and she's been passing as white, and she's married to a white man. So not only is, she, is it the problem of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a mulatto who's passing as a white person, which is dramatic in itself, but she's married to a white man, which in the South was literally against the law. There were miscegenation laws, especially in Mississippi, that were very harsh, very, very harsh indeed. And we follow the drama of Julie, and it's not trivialized at all. The poor woman has to um, live hidden from the truth, uh, I mean, hiding her, her, her truth from the world. Um, 
And when the company and the law discover her true identity, she voluntarily leaves the showboat because the people on the showboat have loved her and have protected her. And out of care and concern for them, she sacrifices her own security by leaving with her husband for what is ultimately her own doom, as we find out in Act Two. And the character of Julie, though she really appears very little in the show in terms of time on the stage, um, is a very pitiable and a very uh, moving character. Showboat was uh, an innovation in many ways. Uh, it was the first time that black and white choruses were presented in a show, and each of them had, in a sense, equal time and equal stature. Uh, it was uncommon enough to have a black chorus or any black performers in a, an otherwise white show. But in this particular case, the black and white chorus actually sing in counterpoint with each other and appear on the stage together. And I know that seems incredibly trivial today, but it was a, a landmark uh, of an experience in 1927 when Ziegfeld did it. And it's not only um, a compliment to the creativity of Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein, but when you think about the financial risk that it presented to Florence Ziegfeld, it's a tremendous um, uh, comment upon uh, the bravery of this man that he would do something like this. Of course, I had many strange reactions to it because, first of all, I came expecting to see a Florence Ziegfeld show. And then there was there suddenly there, there was a scene with a little girl being let into a nunnery. And there were these ladies, you know, in their <laughs> nuns. Not down. dressed like a Ziegfeld no, girl. Yeah, exactly. And I was, I was sort of awed and taken aback. And also the, the splendor of the production. And I was completely, I was young enough to be taken in by the whole story and the, the life cycle. That he would have a Broadway show open with the lines, niggers all work on the Mississippi, niggers all work while the white folks play, loading up boats with the bales of cotton, get to no rest till the judgment day. That's a very daring quatrain with which to open a Broadway musical in an era when audiences were accustomed to hearing nice looking white people come out with tennis rackets and sing about uh, uh, playing tennis on the lawn in Long Island, or uh, gee, I want to be a star in a Ziegfeld show, or something like that. The themes of Broadway musicals were essentially rather trivial in those days. He was terribly worried about it. It was a complete departure from anything um, that certainly that he'd ever done, anything in the musical comedy theater. Um, I always had a sneaking suspicion that the reason he really didn't like it was because the girls had so much clothes on. You know, those old kind of clothes. And although they were the most beautiful things you ever saw, um, but I, I always felt that way about him. He, uh, um, but he bellyached and carried on and griped and complained all the time about Shoba. The song he hated absolutely hated but couldn't make Jerry Kern and Oscar Hammerstein take out of the show was Old Man River. He hated that song. But on the road it was fine. Everything went fine and the critics liked it and all that sort of thing. And we came into New York and uh, opened at the Ziegfeld Theater. And Mr. Ziegfeld was so sure that they weren't going to like it. He just was so sure. But during the performance, the opening night, nobody applauded. Um, they sat there in shock. <laughs> That's the only way we could describe it. Mr. Ziegfeld and I sat on the stairs in the back of the theater leading up to the uh, um, balcony, and he was crying. I mean, the dude, I knew this goddamn show wasn't going to be any good. I knew it wasn't. I told them, I told them, and they wouldn't listen, and they wouldn't listen. And I said, well, Mr. Ziegfeld, they're not applauding because they're enjoying it. Oh, you're crazy. You know what you're talking about. And I mean, this went on till the end of the show. And finally, there was applause, of course, you know, but nothing like you would expect from a great big hit. And he and, and uh, the uh, general manager went somewhere, and we went around to a speakeasy and waited for the news and um, the, re the reviews. And oh, they were sensational. They're absolutely sensational. And the next morning, 
you couldn't get to the box office. The line was two blocks long. And I called him on the phone and I said, you better get down here, you won't believe what you see out here. So he did come down for once and um, he, he, he was beside himself with joy. She was a, a triste person, that's the only word I can think of. She, she was very beautiful and very sensuous and very quiet and loving and warm, uh, but also terribly vulnerable. She was exactly what Julie was, uh, but she was, she was fascinating in that way. She wasn't glamorous, she wasn't exotic, this is my opinion, but she had embracing qualities about her. I just adored her, but then I was nine years old, you know. And, but other people, of course, saw these qualities and interpreted them in different ways. And of course, Dad and Jerry Kern uh, were fascinated by her qualities to the extent that they wrote a show just for her called Sweet Adeline. Uh, and they wrote just the right kinds of songs for her to sing, sort of melancholy songs. It was the first time that they dealt with human drama and uh, um, miscegenation with the with prejudice uh, and they showed that that uh, the musical theater uh, could deal with serious subjects it wasn't just a place to go and watch the girls kick up their heels uh, and listen to some swell songs but this in 1927 really brought the musical theater to maturity <laughs> 